Dobroveče svima. Hello everyone and welcome. Uh, we are glad to have here Alfie Baun. Uh, Dr. Alfie Baun is a lecturer in digital media culture and technology at Royal Holloway University of London and his main research interests are in psychoanalysis, digital media, critical theory and of course video games. Uh, Alfie Baun is author of numerous books. I will just mention some of the titles. Enjoying it Candy Crash and Capitalism from 2015, The PlayStation Dream World from 2017, which was translated into Serbian as Svets Nova i Vido Igara. You can buy it here in front, yeah. And some of the recent titles are Post Memes, uh, Seizing the Memes of Production from 2019, and his most recent title is Dream Lovers, The Gamification of Relationships from 2022. I hope that Alfie is currently working on a on, on, uh, new book. So, tonight's event will be divided uh, into two parts. First, uh, Alfie Baun will uh, give a lecture that will last for 35 or 40 minutes. And then a uh, professor and um, research associate Biljana Mitrovic and lecturer uh, Nikola Shoshkic and game producer and game designer will join us in some sort of a round table and discussion. So that's it for introduction. Alfie, please, the stage is all yours. Great, great. Thank you. Hi, thanks everyone for coming. Um, so yeah, uh, I'll just, uh, uh, as was said, I'll just, um, talk a little bit about uh, something um, for about half an hour. And I decided to um, talk about video games, but not really in a direct way. Um, so uh, hopefully um, it'll still be relevant if people are here for a discussion of games. Uh, it'll still be relevant, but I wanted to, to do it a little bit differently, partly because um, actually it's a long time ago I wrote this book, um, The PlayStation Dream World. I, I don't know what the translation is, Svetsnova something. Uh, and um, not, not just that um, it's a long time for me, but also um, even yesterday, I did a talk at the Philosophical Theatre uh, in, in Belgrade here, and um, someone commented afterwards, oh, all the examples, uh, you know, they were like before the pandemic, nothing after the pandemic. And I thought, well, that's kind of true, but, you know, I, and I, re I really wrote um, that book um, because of uh, the Trump, the Donald Trump uh, meme communities and uh, the 2014 Gamergate saga, which, you know, so, so in, in 2014, you had this Gamergate uh, saga where, you know, this kind of question of games and politics really kind of flared up um, and then it very quickly sort of transitioned into this idea of a rising far right uh, which is sometimes referred to as the alt right uh, which Angela Nagel's book which is also uh, there kind of explores and so it was very like of of its moment um, so um, I don't have that much to say about um, video games since the pandemic or something like that. But what I do have uh, something to say about is um, the way in which um, game, the logic of gaming and uh, the, the psychological experience of gaming uh, is uh, even more important in the increasingly digital uh, sort of post-pandemic world, I guess. So um, what I've decided to do with this talk is to talk mainly about, um, well, desire and love in the digital world. And then I want to try to connect it to uh, what playing a video game is like, what, what a video game is and what is important about video games. Because um, what I think ultimately, why I think video games are important is not just because, oh, you know, they're, they're the new cinema, they're, they're the biggest growing, industry and so on. But I think video games, they, they uniquely allow us, and, and, and in this way they, they embody digital media, um, they allow us to experience desires, emotions, empathy, which are not the ones we normally experience in our everyday life. So, uh, you know the word um, arcade, video games arcade? Uh, among many um, gamers of your age, I can see you guys are quite young. I'm, I'm not uh, that old. I'm 36. It's my birthday today. Um, and uh, but but I still just about started gaming in when there were lots of arcades, right? Where you go into the video games arcade and you um, 
you would play some some games in there. There was a little bit other people socializing in there. I was really just the end of that. I'm not sure about in, in Serbia, but in London, where I grew up, they closed all the arcades in the 90s. In Hong Kong, I was recently living in Hong Kong, uh, and they closed all the arcades in the, the 2000, around 2010. They began to really finish. So, and, and now there's very few video games arcades left. It's actually very difficult to actually find one. Um, but uh, this... Um, idea of an arcade is, is really important for me. And uh, if, if I don't know if people here study sort of philosophy and, and Marxism and things, but um, the, there's another kind of arcade, right? And that is the arcade of the 19th century. Uh, and the most important um, text about this is Walter Benjamin's Arcades Project, uh, the sort of German Jewish Marxist uh, writer who's written this extremely long um, collection of ideas about the 19th century concept of the arcade. Now, what the arcade is in the 19th century is uh, because they had new um, uh, technologies for glass, producing glass walls, and, and also the iron works, you know, making iron for the first time, large iron structures, um, which is obviously massive influence on 19th century literature and industrialization and so on. So they created these arcades, which are iron and glass structures, and uh, they are a world of commodities. The, the, the later, they're mostly in Paris and London, but they're also all over Europe, and they became later the department store, right, the department stores that we hate today. But... Um, Initially, this was enormous. And if you were a 19th century uh, subject walking into an arcade, people felt it was uh, absolutely um, surreal, quite bizarre. A bit like maybe somebody in the 14th century walking into a huge medieval cathedral or church with the stained glass windows or whatever. And the concept of the arcade was to put you in a space where you had different feelings than the ones you had outside. So people would go into the arcades, and this is, of course, 19th century capitalism. The point is to sell products, but also to transform the subject into a new kind of subject who exists in this surreal world of commodities. And in Walter Benjamin's book, he shows in so many different ways how this works with different kinds of advertising, the bizarre, crazy, dreamlike uh, experience of entering this space of commodities, this world of commodities. Now, in around 2014, I, I had this uh, idea that the, this is what video games are, basically the modern version of entering into this weird, strange, dreamlike world of commodities. And, and so they have this power over the subject. And it's a mostly capitalist power, but it's also so crazy and bizarre and interesting that there's exciting potential here as well. That the fact that we can be immersed in things in this way and we can be made to feel different things, we can be made to desire different things. Um, so uh, I'm going to, to, to talk about this question of desire and how the digital world uh, changes our experiences of it by putting us in these kind of arcades. My basic idea is every time you look at your screen, with this phone or with your, your video games console or with your computers, you enter into a, a different kind of arcade, a new kind of digital arcade. Okay, so um, I'm going to just talk a bit about this and, and, and then sort of, um, yeah, I'll, you'll see where I'm, where I'm, what I'm doing, I hope. So uh, I want to read some uh, quote from Roland Barthes, uh, the sort of French post-structuralist sort of theorist who's um, usually like famous for other things apart from this. And, and for me, uh, the only really interesting, the most interesting book is, is this book that Roland Barthes wrote um, called A Lover's Discourse, which is these very strange um, sort of uh, little bits. It's very similar, actually, to Benjamin's Arcades Project. So, I mean, I have a very low attention span, so I actually can't read a long book. So I prefer books that are like fragments and things like this, as you probably see. Um, but here in, in this um, uh, book, he has this um, concept, and he calls it the scene of enamoration. And it's in a chapter called Ravishment. Okay, so these are, uh, I don't know how, 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 how the, what these words sound like to, to you guys, but ravishment is like if something ravishes you, it's like you see it and you really want it, right? So it's usually just usually, usually describing like a, maybe a woman or a man that you're interested in, you're ravished, you know, you just, you can think of nothing else except for them. Um, but it could also be like something else like 
you know, a, a type of meal, food that you really, you saw on Instagram, someone eating this uh, thing and you suddenly feel this pull of desire or whatever. Or it could be anything like a Pokemon or something. I'm always talking about Pokemon. Uh, you know, you really want to capture this cute little thing and, and, and bring it home with you or whatever. This is uh, ravishment and he calls it this an enamoration, meaning the moment where I become enamored. Right, um, and he um, described something pretty crazy here, in my opinion. Uh, so I'll just read this quote quickly. The first thing we love is a scene. For love at first sight requires the very sign of its suddenness. What makes me irresponsible, subject to fatality, swept away, ravished. So you can see this kind of language. And of all the arrangement of objects, it is the scene which seems to be seen best for the first time. A curtain parts, I am initiated. The scene consecrates the object I'm going to love. So the language he borrows um, here is um, from really from uh, drama, you know, the curtain parts, and you see the thing. Although in this book he has these um, annotations in the side, and it actually says, um, Sorrows of Young Werner, which is a Goethe novel. And uh, th this is also a really interesting example in, in Goethe where uh, he, the narrator sees um, Charlotte, the object he, he falls in love with, and he describes, I noticed her and also all these children around and the bread and the knife, and she's cutting this bread and she's passing it out to the children, and he decides, I'm now in love. So Roland Barthes is saying something here which is radically different to the way we conceive of love in society, because he says, and the first phrase, the, the two things I like the most here is the first, the first thing we love is a scene, okay? And then second one, the arrangement of objects. These are the two things which I think are important. The first thing we love is a scene. In other words, love, desire, enamoration, ravishment, it's not about subject and object, which is the way we always talk about it. Do you love her, him, it, you know? Why are you so obsessed with him? Why are you so obsessed with her? Why do you like this? You know, it's always framed as subject and object. And this is how we, we talk about desire in our society. Roland Barthes is saying, first of all and most important is not the subject or the object, but the scene. As in, how does it appear among things? Right? What, and, and, this is also, and, and this is also the phrase, arrangement of objects. So out of all of the objects, why are we making eye contact, you know? Why out of all of the things when I go on Deliveroo to order my dinner, or what is it, that, that you don't have Deliveroo, but like, you know, food delivery service, Vault, or whatever it's called here. Why does one of them spring up? When you're looking at all the cute pictures of Pokemon, why does one come out to you? And it's the, the way they're organized as a, as a scene, as a scene, which, which, it, which most allows us to desire which allows desire to, to become possible, to enamoration, ravishment to happen, this kind of things. So uh, this, I think, is, is, is um, fantastic, the scene of enamoration this, as concept. And I just simply wanted to replace the word scene with the word screen, um, because I think this, this allows us to start thinking about digital media and the role it plays. What is digital media? It is a sort of the new scene of desire, right? Uh, we don't you go uh, we don't desire always like something on our phone we still need real things you know like a food or uh, a man or a woman or whatever it might be that we find uh, but the way our desire starts the way it is structured it comes you know through this screen of enamoration this kind of desire or whatever that digital media is and for me this is the experience of uh, digital media and I'll, I'll come off to it so I mentioned already these Pokemon. Do I need to say more about Pokemon? There's not enough time. But, but, uh, but people are always saying to me, you know, there's this really interesting essay in Freud. It's in his essay on group psychology, um, where he, um, he, he says that it's not a coincidence the way we use the word love. You know how you can say like, oh, I love my wife. I love my child, I love ramen, you know, I love this university, you know, you know, the way we, we use this word in this way, he, he says that um, 
there's something really uh, interesting in the way we, we it's, it's not like there's different kinds of love. There's just all these different ways we use it. And, and I think there's something really bizarre about the fact that we, we relate to Pokemon in the same way as we relate to lovers or whatever. These are the objects. And this is the experience of the Benjaminian arcade, right? Like you go onto your phone and, and one place is like some hot man or hot woman you're supposed to fancy. And right next to it, the next swipe, it's like a bowl of uh, chicken or whatever, that's deep fried chicken that you might want to order. And the next one, it's a house you might want to buy. And the next one, it's a Pokemon you might want to catch or whatever. So I think this kind of arrangement of objects is what we're actually dealing with uh, and which digital media and video games plays around with. Um, so now I'm gonna change the slide to something that may be a little bit surprising. Um, which is a website <laughs> that uh, I hope you guys are not on. Uh, so if you saw me there, it was just for research, I promise. Um, so I started to, to think about how this arrangement of objects can be manipulated in different ways and what does it actually do uh, to us uh, that, that our screens uh, arrange us uh, as objects among many in this world of, of people and things. And uh, one of the interesting things I came across was this uh, Trump.dating. It's a crazy, crazy, crazy example. Uh, because also this guy, uh, who was the actor from the advert, he turned out to be a sexual assaulter, uh, and he was then fired or whatever from the, the campaign for the website. But um, there's actually, the craziest thing is, there's, there's not just one, but two Donald Trump dating websites. Now, what does this show? It shows, and, and, and I'm not really one to talk too much about you know, this uh, right-wing stuff, actually, um, because I think it's just as bad in the, in the left, in the center, in the right. I think these, but what is so interesting about the emergence of something like this is it's recognizing that there is actually a, a, a confusion of desire going on. Like, we, we want Donald Trump or we want Barack Obama, like you think about the yes we can slogan and the way this captures people's imagination in the 2000s and then how Donald Trump was appealing to people libidinally. We also want a girlfriend or a boyfriend or whatever, but there, there's something's gone wrong when they, they sort of come together, but they, it does kind of work, of course, in another way. And it's like, when you, when you sign up to this site, look at the, the quiff of the hair. I mean, it makes me want to sign up if, in, in some way, even though I, you know, not a Trump person, of course, but th there's something very interesting going on about this, um, the awareness that di we can be organized through our desires. And uh, I don't want to repeat so much what I was talking about yesterday, but I basically think that in, in the old days uh, of revolutionary activity that may be best embodied by um, May 1968, uh, where uh, following your desires was conceived of by the left or the socialist or whatever you want to call it, the Marxist movement, as a good thing to do, right? Follow your desires and that will lead us into a sexual revolution, also perhaps a, a, a full revolution, economic revolution. We, we live in the opposite world now, where the last thing you should do is trust your desires. Because when you enter these digital platforms, you're, you're always feeling everything. You're always feeling desire. You're always feeling empathy. Uh, and, and it can be for anything at all. And this is, this is a really interesting example of something where uh, the corporation has a sort of unconscious sense that people can be controlled or moved around in this unique kind of way. If you're a leftist, which I expect many of you are, don't worry, there's a dating app for you as well. Um, you can also try this Red Yenta, uh, which is a dating app for... Uh, I don't know, communist, socialist, Marxist types, or whatever. Um, there's another one, OK Comrade, uh, which is uh, supposed to come out soon. Uh, so again, there, there are all these things. And it's all about this economy where people's desires can be sort of uh, managed and used and so on. Now, to come a bit towards video games again, I uh, want to, to, to think about this um, question of, uh, what is this? Uh, question of pickup artistry or relationships and gaming. I basically think there's a there's a, a kind of very close connection between relationships and gaming. Um, again, um, the a quick 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 example, um, which I, I, I mentioned um, 
mentioned before, but is the, the gay dating app Grindr. Uh, it was purchased by a Chinese gaming company, uh, and, the, and, and Grindr um, it uses a lot of gamification techniques to sell, uh, you know, gay relationships, gay sex, and so on. And uh, it uses uh, rewards and, and point systems and all sorts of different interesting things. So th there is this connection between the dating world and the gaming world, which is basically, I guess, where this lecture is about. T Tinder is a good example. It's basically like a card game. You know, you're swiping left and right or whatever. But almost all of uh, all of almost all of dating apps have this feature, right? It's all like a game. What line do you say first? It's like a chat bot or whatever, you know. You do, and then you get this. Oh, did you do you send that first message to everyone the same? And all this stuff. It's like this kind of like pickup artistry. And in a way, I think we're all pickup artists now. This is. I mean, I'm actually getting married, so I'm not a pickup artist, I promise. But you know what I mean. We're all in a world where uh, dating and relationships have become gamified in quite a sh surprising way, I think. Uh, so this is a long history through gaming, which I wanted to kind of study. This is also part of the book that, that's here. Um, where you look at like, the male ones and the female ones, and you see there's a long history of gamified dating. This example is absolutely crazy from uh, a game called Super Seducer, which is kind of a joke uh, and kind of not. Uh, and uh, it basically teaches you how to um, uh, talk to women. And here you can see some example. Brush her hair back and tell her she has cute little ears. <laughs> Um, uh, but then on the other hand, there's all this list over here, which is also this long history of game uh, dating simulators which are uh, aimed towards women, uh, which have a little bit different vibe. Uh, I don't know if anyone is uh, old enough to remember this example, Girl Garden. It's, uh, you know, in Japan, they have this bizarre uh, flower arranging. Right, so you you got to arrange the flowers in a pretty way, and this is considered a sort of sport or something. But in Girl Garden, you have to arrange the flowers in a beautiful way, and if you are uh, able to do so well enough, you get a husband. And if you don't, uh, if your flowers are too ugly, he marries the other girl. Um, it's actually very fun. Um, but there's this all this is the kind of long history of this intertwining between gaming and dating, which is what is really I'm, I'm talking about here. Uh, if you want a real, real uh, quite shocking experience, I advise you to try Summer Lesson. And I will say something about virtual reality pornography, actually, just for fun. But anyway, this game is crazy stuff, crazy stuff. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a PlayStation VR, so you put the headset on. And you are a, um, uh, a, a teacher, English teacher in Japanese uh, society. And you teach these girls Japanese. Uh, you teach these girls various things. You can teach them guitar, or you can teach them English. And they do things like they feed you cake with a spoon. And you've got the headset on. You've got to imagine you're going like that. You know, <laughs> uh, and you got. And I mean, I find this crazy, and but also really, this is kind of um, this weird, bizarre relationship between um, the technology and desire, which is just really sort of staring you in the face in a quite an obvious way. Uh, now, when I was in Hong Kong, I went to this uh, virtual reality. A pornography party. <laughs> so you you go there and you you put the headset on, and you um you you choose something from a long selection of uh, porn. <laughs> I don't even watch porn normally. I just I just thought it was important to, to try. And uh, I, anyway, you put this uh, headset on, uh, and um, I tried a few things. Um, I noticed there were two types, really. <laughs> One is like um, very simple, cheaper to do. I'm sure you guys, digital art people, you get a 360 camera and you film some people having sex or whatever. And then when you put the headset on, you become the camera. So you're just basically in the room and you're watching normal stuff. Well, it might not be, but you know, you just 3D version of what you normally see on pornography or whatever. The other kind was unbelievable to me. You put the headset on and it's like P POV, pornography or whatever. You put the headset on and you're, you're in the guy's head, like this shot here. And you look down and you've got someone else's penis or whatever, instead of your own. Now, I mean, I, I wanted to do like a proper castration, anxiety, psychoanalytic analysis of this. And I did do that in the book, but uh, in, in a, a later book. But what, what seems incredibly interesting about this, and I, I also thought, you know, I'm not really sort of, um, yeah, 
I'm not doing a feminist critique, but if I was doing a feminist critique, I would say that this is an incredible example of what Irigaray calls homosociality. Like, you get to be the other guy. You step into the other guy. And this this relationship between men or something, where all men actually get to put the headset on, look down, and you are suddenly sort of, and it's like castration, but also you finally got the phallus, and it's crazy stuff, and I think there's a lot to be said about it. But for me, what was important about this was more simple than that. It's just the, the, the simple relationship between desire and technology. That this is what we're actually dealing with, that when you enter the headset, you experience the desire of someone else. Now, this sounds a bit, should I share this? It sounds a bit um, too personal. But I thought, when I went to this place, I thought to myself, I'm going to hate this. I don't, you know, this is not for me. I don't, I don't watch pornography. I don't really enjoy sex. So this is going to be the worst thing for me. But as when you're in, you can enjoy it. You can, you can sort of get into it and enjoy it. Uh, I felt the same when I went to a sex robot brothel, um, <laughs> which I'll, I'll just quickly skip that. These, I tried to visit this place. It was just utterly crazy. Um, but anyway, um, uh, and uh, what I think is critical about this, and, and there are some interesting work on VR uh, done by many people, which I've put here, some of it, but um, the point is that what these technologies can do, they can make you feel the desire of another. Now, that is incredible. And, and another example of that would be a company, um, okay, cool, four minutes, that's perfect. Um, a company called Within, they did a test about getting people to give money to charity. And they made some films um, uh, which were like, you know how you see it on, on anything, starving children or whatever, please give some money to support them. And then they made like virtual reality versions and they found that people uh, were giving like three or four times more money because of uh, the VR. And of course it is because it's an empathy machine. It, it produces the ability to step into a, an environment and make you feel of certain things and so on. And so the, 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 the most but the, the only really successful virtual reality industry is the pornography industry, but it works precisely the same, right? You're, you're able to desire as another desires or whatever. And I think this actually, it's, it's, and, the, and one more bad example, there's, a, there's some companies which do it for corporations. So you can employ a company to host events. Say you are a company, you wanna get millions of pounds of investment, millions of euros of investment. Um, you can invite your potential investors to an event hosted by a company called Ores. There's one in London called Ores London. There's some all around the world. And they use virtual reality techniques to make the shareholders invest in the company. So it's all going on. It's all happening. If you were, as I say, if you want to take a feminist approach, you can say this is disgraceful, you know. If you want to take an anti-capitalist approach, you can say this is just capitalism. It's, and, and it's all of those things. It's all of those things at, at the same time. But it's also, I think, uh, the radical potential of the, the digital world and the video game space because it allows for a kind of um, recognition that desire is not your own. Uh, the things I, I didn't have time to talk about there uh, is some other uh, pieces of technology that I wanted to, I did, I did cover that, but I wanted to, to mention one other thing which is a, an AI dating chat bot. Um, but in general, um, the thing that seems to me, as I was saying, the thing that seems to me critical is that we have uh, reached the point with these technologies, and it really comes from gaming, where um, they actually can compel you to desire something, empathize with something, uh, I don't know what, what other, uh, maybe even fall in love. Right, they are all mini versions of what Roland Barthes described at the beginning, where you might, and, and another, I think, quite compelling example, like me, when I went to the um, sex robot brothel, thinking, like, I'm going to hate every second of this, but then when you're immersed, you sort of think, okay. You know, another really obvious example from video games would be this thing about shooting people uh, with a sniper rifle. That's the most satisfying shooting in a video game, right? You go in and Call of Duty or whatever, you get the scope, you zoom in on someone's head, you shoot their head off, you know. Of course, in real life, you don't want to shoot someone's head off. You don't desire those things. But what it does is it allows you to step in to a new kind of arcade, just like the medieval peasant who steps into the cathedral 
for the first time in the 14th century, or the 19th century capital, capital, capitalist subject who Walter Benjamin describes, who for the very first time steps into the glass and iron structure of the arcade and suddenly wants to buy commodities that they never before desired. Right? Just like that, the video game space allows you to enter into a space where your desires are not your own. Right? They, are, they are already there for you to, to step into, just like the man with the headset and the, the new penis. Now, what for me is important and radical about that, and this is my last point, is that that is always how desire works. Uh, and this is a sort of psychoanalysis thing. It's not, there is no desire of your own, right? There is only the desire of others. And this was where uh, the, the riots of May 1968 went wrong. They felt like if people follow their own desires, it will lead to revolution, it will lead to a better society. The thing they missed, as, as many interesting psychoanalysis theorists have pointed out, um, is there is no desire of your own. There is only desire of the other. And so what video games and digital media do, in my opinion, they force us to realize this fact that our desires are not and can't be our own. They can only be uh, the desire of the other or whatever. And that, that is, in my opinion, an anti-capitalist uh, realization. So uh, I'm not going to read this quotation in full, but it is the best book written on, on video games uh, ever by Mackenzie Walk, who I sort of won't say too much about their contemporary work because I'm not so, so keen. Um, but it, it is uh, the most interesting and important book written on games, Gamer Theory from uh, 2008, but I think it was written also before that, and a blog is all available free on a blog. But it talks about basically this new game space. Um, Mackenzie's term is game space. Um, I would just uh, say that, and, 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 and she says that uh, we all live in this capitalist game space. Um, I agree, and I think we all live in this new form of arcade. Uh, which is why I started with the concept of arcade. But I think that uh, despite the best efforts of capitalism, there is something radically anti-capitalist about the game space and arcades. Even though there's lots of ways in which capitalism uses it to sell us things, to, to impact on our personality, I think that's all there and it's all bad. <laughs> but there is also something radical in the experience of putting on a a VR headset and having your, you know, your, or, or going into a, an environment where desire is different or shooting someone in the head in Call of Duty. Uh, and it is that it, it, it confronts us with this fact that our desires are not actually our own. They're cultural, social, they're mapped, they're planned, they're controlled, uh, and, and we instead, we desire sort of what we're told to desire or whatever. And for me, this is an anti-capitalist sort of realization uh, and, and could lead, I think, to the sort of radical potential of games, which we, uh, you know, we don't see everywhere, but can, I think, be important and recovered. Okay, cool. That's what I want to say. Thanks for listening. So, we will now join you, and I will read the short biographies of Biljana Mitrovic and Nikola. So Biljana Mitrovic, PhD, is a research associate at the Faculty of Dramatic Arts in Belgrade, as well as at the Institute for Theatre, Film, Radio and Television. And some of her uh, courses at Master's and PhD studies, uh, which could be interested for, uh, of interest for us, are uh, Introduction to Video Games, Audiovisual Text Analysis from Film to Post Media, Digital Turn, Theory and Practice of New Media. Also, uh, Biljana's doctoral dissertation has been awarded in 2018. Uh, Nikola Shoshkic is a lecturer here at FMK at the Department of Digital Arts, and he is the founder, as well as team lead, game designer of uh, Shosha Games, which is a small uh, indie video games uh, studio. So Nikola will also contribute to this discussion with some uh, uh, practical insights from the, from the very uh, uh, a production uh, of video games. So we could start. We could start with Alfie, and thank, thank you for for your lecture. We are going to expand this into uh, the the topic of video games and gamification. But we will also going to refer to to some of your tonight's 
uh, uh, insights here. Uh, maybe I could start with a question uh, related uh, to, to your uh, uh, lecture about the desire and uh, about the fact that you mentioned that in order to be critical, to be sub subversive and, and make some sort of a, a critical or even a transgressive or potentially revolutionary stance, uh, it is important to not be too, you know, empathetic or, or to immerse ourselves ourselves in these, you know, digital media content and whatever. We need sort to 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 keep a bit a bit, you know, of of a distance. In a, in a sense of a critical theory, you mentioned, of course, Benjamin, but there are also Adorno, Horkheimer, culture industry, we know. So could you tell us a bit more about this, about this possibility to, to you know, to deconstruct the, the, the desire in some way? Yeah. Can I? Oh, yeah, I can. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, so, uh, no, I'll, um, you know, I, I want to hear from these guys, so I won't be too long. But I think it's sort of uh, what I think and sort of the opposite. Um, so I do think we need, um, yeah, sort of Benjaminian critical distance. Um, but I also think we need to take the opportunity to immerse ourselves fully in these things. So whereas some liberals or whatever, people like my mum, might say, please do stop shooting those people on the screen. I think it's important to, to precisely enjoy shooting the people, and that's why I bothered to go to the sort of, I don't know, whorehouses of virtual reality, even though I would hate that sort of thing normally, because I think what, so what, what it's actually is more that the subversive potential is found precisely in the ability of these things to be fully uh, and uncritically immersive, right? So we, we're a divided society. Uh, we think our, we, in general, we like to think our desires are pure and other people's desires are corrupt. It's why we have, I don't know, wars, <laughs> cancel culture, all sorts of other cultural and social problems, because we, we don't feel able to uh, uh, see the other as human. I'd say we're not a very humanist society. We, we, see, we think in terms of purity or, or complicity. Um, so I think what our society needs most of all is to, to redeem something like a, a universal empathy or whatever. We do need to be able to see each other as people and even the most stupid desires. I mean, we had a, an interesting conversation the other day while I've been here about people who support Putin. Now, on the one hand, it might be tempting to say, well, these people are ourselves because they support Putin. But on the other hand, you know, people only desire things because they've, uh, they, they, they have such bad material and economic conditions conditions or lack of opportunities or whatever and they get sucked into ideology and this is how ideology works so we're capable of thinking and feeling anything even if you're very well educated and you're capable of believing all sorts of things and some of your opinions and beliefs could be really kind of fucked up you know <laughs> but and I think what this kind of technology at its best can show us is that you can actually feel those things you can go into a game as an American soldier and shoot an Arab in the head and think, oh great, yeah, one, you know, one more kill. Now that's racist and American imperialist and it's bad, but if it can show you, oh shit, this is how desire works. No wonder people get uh, corrupted and, 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 and into danger with these, this world, in this world we live. Then it could have the subversive potential, the socialist potential, that actually we're all subjects in this world and we're all uh, with warped and, and, and messed up desires that are culturally constructed and economically and materially influenced and so on. And that, that for me is where one could find like a subversive uh, gaming, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you thank you for your answer. And I would like to uh, ask Biljana, who is, uh, whose uh, PhD thesis was, was based on video games in one particular genre, let's say, since Biljana uh, is coming and her theoretical background is literature and narrative studies, let's say, uh, to what extent is it important to include narratology as a theoretical framework uh, into the video games and the ludology studies, let's say? Well, um, I think that Everyone who, who deal with video game studies are familiar with uh, that kind of differences between ludologists and narratologists, especially at the very beginning of game studies at the first years of 21st century. And that the, the idea of uh, making new uh, new branch of uh, humanities, humanity studies, um, the, the video game studies come from uh, 
well, separatistic part of the narratology, uh, narratology field, because first uh, ludologists actually had PhDs in uh, narratology and li literature studies. So um, Espinar said and uh, Yule and uh, well, all basically all of them <laughs> were from the the narratology field, but. After the few years, uh, the, the, that battle was finished, the, the war wa was over, and um, let's say that it was 2005, and they all agreed that the, the narrative and interactivity and ludology, the, the, the video game mechanic, are equal in, in making the the whole game, the making the whole uh, uh, gaming experience. So I don't think that there is in, maybe in any game that there is, a, that you can exclude one part from another. So the, the interactivity and, and the narrative are the, the crucial parts, the essential parts of one whole, even in the, the games where, where you can't see the, the narratives at the, the first, um, first view, like Tetris, you know, you can actually make, make the, the, the that, that was the, the point of one, uh, the narratology part of the, the uh, game study. Uh, Phil, the, the Janet Murray ac actually, uh, argue that uh, you can make the, the story, you can have narrative while playing uh, Tetris that, because that is the story of American uh, society, American uh, working flow, that it is your desk with uh, new tasks, new tasks, new tasks, and when you are at the end of your working day, you have new tasks. So even when you play something so, uh, basic as as Tetris you can still have a uh, have a metaphors and you you have stories which is great because that is something that makes video games uh, uh, art, art, artistic work because you can think and you can uh, uh, imagine the, the the things from the from your really real life experience and to have emotions and empathy uh, other than that that are in the game actually. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, uh, there was one point in in uh, uh, Billionaire's talk that I would like to to address now, to, uh, to Alfie, to you, and that is the the part with the Tetris and you you know mm -hmm. the old school games like Solitaire. You explore that in your book, uh, for 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 you know in o for us in order to be good capitalists and mm -hmm. go good on our, our uh, within our workspace, uh, our boss would recommend to us to to play this as some <laughs> sort of yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was also went. Yeah, I really think it's an important point. Um, and yeah, I, one of the things I was also interested in, uh, like you, is this: what, what, what to make of these histories of game studies, like narratology and ludology and so on. And I guess I, yeah, I wanted to try to sort of, um, yeah, make a b bit more of a political uh, uh, approach to those things than um, those guys. Um, but I think this point about the um, inevitable. Um, storytelling in computing is extremely important so you know with the very first video games uh it's like um i mean i i guess um something like pong was the first big game where you got the two lines and the ball everyone knows that uh, but in in the minds of uh you know young imagine a young boy playing this they're their they're their tennis hero and they're you know, smashing it back, and and it's all it's all embedded, and and, and actually the the yeah, I mean, I looked in, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not so interesting, but the, the the history of war games is the same as the history of games in this sense because there's like something the ve sometimes called the very first video game, 1942, it was invented, is called the cathode ray amusement device. Not the most thrilling name, you know, but basically it's a dot on a screen 
that goes to a certain place and you press the button at the same time the dot is, is there. But the, the idea of the imaginary world behind this was you're defending your town against an artillery shell which is coming towards you and you activate your defense system at the right moment or whatever. So you only need two dots to have a story, to have a narrative, and I think that is really interesting and, and, and worth saying. The other thing I wanted to say, which is in relation to your question, is for me, the so people are always saying to me, um, what's an interesting game? Don't you like Disco Elysium or something like that? Yes, sure, I do. But for me, the most interesting games, there's the simplest ones. I think Candy Crush is more important than Disco Elysium. Uh, and, and as you say, I, I, I wanted to study the way in which Candy Crush gets played in different workplaces. Um, I, I used to be, before as an academic, I used to be a chef, like a cook in a, in a ship pub. And I used to take a pretend to be a smoker. I know you guys are all smokers. But um, I used to pretend to be a smoker so I could have a five minute break. And I would use that five minute break to say to my colleagues, ah, oh, this fucking pub, you know, I hate working here. Uh, and then when I realized around, that was around 2005, by 2008, uh, everyone was playing Candy Crush instead of having these conversations. It, you know, your, your smoker break would on your temple run or whatever it is you're playing. So I think, you know, studying this kind of thing, what actual role do games play in relation to work? Uh, do they absorb energies that could otherwise be directed elsewhere? Do they... Why do workplaces have Xboxes in, in Silicon Valley? You know, these, these kind of questions about the relationship between games and work and stuff is really interesting and important. Yeah, and I, and I just think, you know, that is, that is what I'm interested in. Not, not talking about how, oh, there's one game that's actually got a really interesting story. But, like, what about even the most stupid games and the most popular games and the most simple games? What do they mean socially and culturally and so on? So I think all that stuff is, I, I think, really, really important. Yeah, thank you. And, and uh, regarding some of the uh, video game examples that you have mentioned, we can also discuss a bit about the retro video gaming, which is quite a popular, you know, retro is always in fashion. So, yeah. Could you tell us a bit, Alfie, you, about, uh, 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 about your take on, on the, the retro video game and nostalgia? Yeah, I mean, I'm a bit, I'm a bit sort of, um, a bit sort of torn. Uh, on the one hand, I think that, um, Retro gaming is, is important. It allows you to break away from some of the uh, sort of AAA gaming. I mean, I, I'm of the belief, I, I'm sure we all are, that the last thing we need is a Grand Theft Auto 10 or whatever it is. And not just because, it's just so boring. I mean, I, I actually, I was um, asked to do, um, to be part of a Watch Dogs Legion. You know, it's one of the bigger series of, so if you, if you play Watch Dogs Legion, you can um, you drive your car and you can turn to the radio station. You can listen to me saying this kind of thing. Um, but when I and I got the game in the post, I was so excited. Oh, I'm in Watch Dogs Legion, you know. And I just thought this is a shit. This is the shittest game I've ever played. You know? But so we are, we are kind of reaching the point, I think, where this kind of hypercapitalist gaming isn't really satisfying people anymore. Uh, and that is really interesting. So I think that you know, it's 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 in, uh, maybe you know we can do things with uh, open access, cheaper software, cheaper hardware that is more interesting. Uh, so in this sense, I think um, you know retro gaming um, has a, a, a sort of really exciting, interesting potential. I'd love to know what you think from the games industry. Um, on the other hand, um, it does lead into a quite strange kind of nostalgia often. And I think, I, I mean, I'm not going to like fully um, talk about it here, but I think the relationship between games and nostalgia is, is critical always. Uh, games always kind of have to do with nostalgia, a bit like science fiction films. So you can't really separate gaming from nostalgia. It's always part of it. It's, you know, for the, the concept of um, um, sort of like... Um, Oh, what's the what's the idea? All the hidden things that you could sort of you know find in in a video game, whatever, like the little uh, Easter eggs or yeah, these kind of things. You know, it, it's there's a, I mean that's basically as long a history the hi history of Easter eggs is as long a history of the history of gaming, and it's always been part of it. You know, this kind of like community building based on knowledge, nostalgia, self reference, and stuff like that. So I think that is really interesting, and I, I guess I'm less inclined to think that's a good thing. Um, but you know, yeah, retro games, you know, they, they, yeah, that, that's not that's that's a separate topic, I guess. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Nicole, I would like to hear your take on on retro gaming. You, you have produced, uh, of course, a game within the Shosha Games, and it, it is a platformer in 3D. But somehow it reminded me. I haven't played it, but I've watched you know the clips on the YouTube. It, it somehow reminded me of, of the good old you know 1990s and some similar games. Yeah. Well, we, um, 
when uh, we even think about creating games, I think we come from our own desire. In a sense, um, as we are creators, uh, I think of games I played when I was young and maybe try to recreate that feeling uh, with newer generations. So in, in our sense, we are making game that is uh, that is similar to newer games. It's similar to, I'd say, It Takes Two or stuff like that. Uh, but uh, when we talk to people, when we show it to people, uh, it always reminds them to one of maybe three retro games now retro games that they played, uh, or maybe 90s Mario's or uh, some Zelda, and uh, people I think have a uh, like personal connection with games, and they they would like to uh, to revisit them. You know that phrase uh, when you watch the v very good film or or watch the series, and you say like oh, I I I would love to to forget about this and try to uh, relive it again. I think people always seek the, those, uh, let's say, um, childish wonder that they experience first time, and it's especially exaggerated in gaming because uh, uh, we are the generation that, uh, uh, that really uh, first time, we are first time in generation that uh, uh, experience the gaming and interactivity of some uh, art form or medium where uh, our action could result in some reaction and we would uh, like uh, I remember playing the first games and uh, talking to everybody about them uh, like the moment when you uh, press the, the, the keyboard button and something moves there uh, you feel like you are in control and uh, that's why retro gaming I think it's always uh, it's always gonna be uh, retro games uh, like if I make the game now my studio uh, probably in like if the game is success of course in 20 years some some kid will say oh that's uh, like that uh, what mean you game that I played as a child so uh, I think that uh, first time entering uh, let's say the arcade uh, first time entering is always that first uh, uh, sense of wonder that we always uh, uh, try to relive with uh, modern games. And I think we don't really get it. Uh, and that's why we keep searching, keep seeking the new experiences. And that's why retro gaming is always so relevant. relevant. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so, Bilena, we've already tackled the uh, issue of subversion. Uh, big question, yeah. Big topic, yeah. But w what would be your take on the, the subversion within the video games world? Well, actually, uh, um, that's something that I already said, but if, for me, if video games want to be art, they need to be subversive. Uh, meaning uh, they are subversion in so many levels in, in video games that something that I, well, I can call it meta subversion, subversion of, I don't know, genres or mechanics or way of um, interactivity, you know, the, the, the elements of uh, video games, uh, twisting uh, the, the ways of how the, the, the games uh, work. But on the other hand, there is uh, uh, subver subversion in a field of meaning, in the field of narratives, in the field of uh, um, dealing with uh, with the stories, with the characters, and I think that subversion is well, really interesting and an important thing in every every level and in, the, in every part of the society and living in, like uh, individuals but in games that is most crucial to to be uh, for games to be something else than product you know something the, the object of capitalistic desire something that you can buy or download for free and to possess something that will uh, mm, push you to, to think and to, to reinterpret uh, the, the, your views and your life it all. Mm -hmm. uh, so Nicola, do you intend with your games or some, some planned projects for the future to sort of deconstruct or subvert some of the video game tropes and narrative wise or video game mechanic wise, whatever? I mean, that, that's a really complicated question in the sense uh, for, for especially for a young studio. 
because we are in the let's say hands of uh, capitalism in a sense we need to uh, we need to find uh, something that works something that we can sell actually and keep working on the games but uh, there is interesting thing t there uh, to talk about in a sense when we when we try to sell a game uh, we try to to think sub sub sorry um, you yeah, know. Subversive, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, In a sense, uh, people are, uh, as I said, always seeking new, new adventures, new experiences, uh, and they, uh, when they want to buy a game, if there is some hook to it, uh, let's say I'm bringing it down to like basic level, uh, if they, there is some hook to it, if there is something uh, totally different than any other game, uh, they are interested in it. In a sense, uh, they want to see what is that new, uh, why is that different, uh, and why, why, why is that game different than any other. And the only way we can actually sell the game is if we find that uh, different thing. Uh, for example, let's say No Man's Sky said that they have a game that is uh, like it would take you uh, 10, 10 billion years to explore it all. That, that is, in a sense, uh, already so different and so some, something that we still didn't, didn't see before. And uh, we want to try it. We want to see what that is, actually. Uh, and on that topic, I think the gaming industry as a whole is uh, going in some direction of, uh, let's say, space some direction of creating space where things happen. And uh, I think the, the, the most, uh, uh, the best thing that you can do as a gamer is to, uh, to immerse yourself in it. In a sense, uh, industry wants you to have a space where you can do, uh, let's say, a limited, uh, where you can have a limited possibilities. Everyone wants that one game that will be the game to kill the, all the other games. That one game that where, where you go to watch a cinema, where you go in and play Candy Crush if you want to play Candy Crush. Or one game where uh, there are no limits and there are no like production uh, production uh, difficulties, where there are no technological difficulties. I think uh, suburb, submersive. Uh, sorry, I, I my, I'm too tired for <laughs> for this kind of uh, language. Uh, I think that uh, the most important thing is to have a game uh, that people can actually uh, have free will in it. If you understand, we we want to have a uh, let's say we want to have a world that is parallel to this one. We want to have. Uh, People that can be in the same room, that can uh, uh, have the same environment, but uh, think about different things. And uh, the, 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 the act of being in that game and deciding for your own uh, is the act of um, that su suburb. <laughs> <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean. Okay. Okay. <laughs> my my uh, my English is not uh, not so perfect. Uh, okay, so, so Ni Nicola mentioned this idea of novelty and newness, which is which is one one topic and the concept you explore also in your book. The the idea that we always have to we need to have some new thing in technology, and that is the very logic of capitalism. You know, the, this idea to produce something that is new or even something that will deconstruct some previous genre. You know structures and, and frameworks. Yeah, I mean, I guess um, on, on that um, conversation there, um, uh, I would, is this on? It's, it's off, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. It's on. Oh, right. It's just the light, yeah. Yeah. Um, no, it was off. Yeah, and then it's just trying to one more, okay. It's just the light. Yeah, yeah, it's just yeah. The light doesn't work. The thing does. So much about the technology. Yeah. No, but I, I mean, I, I guess um, on on this topic uh, that's come up here, I'd say that I'm actually quite. Um, I, I think the worst thing. I've got two points, I suppose. The worst thing that could happen to games is the kind of Minecraft direction, uh, or the Roblox direction, or the Metaverse direction, uh, and it's it, it's um, it's basically turning video games into a platform, um, or uh, you know, and I think that is when it stops becoming art actually. So uh, these Minecraft is always one where people would say, well, isn't this good? You know, because you can actually do educational things inside there. You know, my daughter plays a lot of Minecraft and she, you know, people say, well, Minecraft, that's okay. When I say she plays video games, 
they I uh, say, oh, she's into Minecraft. People say, oh, Minecraft. Well, that that's okay, isn't it? It's like Lego, you know. So, but I think it's the absolute worst because, and and with Roblox as well, because what they basically are is um, free labor harvesting platforms, just like Uber or airbnb or deliver or you know the companies like that because or, or, or facebook you know they're basically a space where they say well here's the free tools to build something and we get uh, the most the largest percentage of the profits of your free labor or whatever so you're getting the, some of the most talented young individuals who become passionate about minecraft or roblox or whatever plunging their talents and talents and efforts into uh, creating servers and hosting int really interesting, thoughtful servers on Minecraft or whatever. But it's basically the same as people who run interesting YouTube channels through a platform like YouTube, where the, the harvesting of the income is just like the, the most capitalist thing you can do. So I, I'm wary of games which take this kind of approach. And the other thing I wanted to say that, that sort of came up there is, um, you know, I, I think the most subversive games are sometimes the most problematic ones, you know. And I, I, I don't think it's the case that, like, oh, uh, you know, sure, uh, Grand Theft Auto and um, FIFA. What, what else would be a stupid example? Football Manager. I used to play a lot of Football Manager. Uh, they're, they're bad, you know. Uh, whereas uh, Papers, Please or Disco Elysium that's doing something interesting. I'm not sure about that. I think the, the, the most subversive games are the ones which uh, have mass appeal and which um, allow people to, to, to experience something quite... I would say the same, though, about sort of Hollywood film versus art house film. I, I think Hollywood film and the history of Hollywood cinema is often more subversive than art house cinema. Right. It's just it's not as bourgeois, or whatever, but it's it's more impactful. It's more revolutionary. It's more transformative. And I, I sort of think this is the way to think about what's happening with games. Right. Not not like can we do something interesting in one game, but like aren't games themselves subversive. Right. So uh, it all, I, I think like it's not necessarily the case of like, oh, could we make subversive games? But actually, it's already subversive. The question is, for, for whom? You know, is, is it uh, subversive in the service of capitalists or is it subversive in the service of community? And this is, that's, that's a, or, or whatever else it might be. And I think it's, all, it's both of those things. And games are revolutionary. They have revolutionized things. Uh, they have done so often in the service of capitalism, but they have also got other revolutionary uh, roles. You know, they, they, new kinds of community building, new kinds of um, art production and so on. So, yeah, I, I think, I don't know, anyway, I just, I just sort of want to, yeah, I, I don't know exactly what I think, but I, I often think that, um, yeah, dividing games into subversive and not subversive, uh, you've, already, you've already stopped being subversive if you're doing that, I think. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, now it's time to address the audience. Do you have any questions? Please, put all that. Uh, hi, and thank you, and happy birthday. Somebody said, so I want to transfer a happy birthday. Um, I have a question for all of you together in from uh, your point of view and field, but I'll just make a short introduction. So like a couple of days ago in a very uh, successful studio in uh, Belgrade, they fired like, I don't know, like half of a team. Uh, so, and it's a, a team, uh, it's a company which built their uh, legacy by copying Candy Crash. So it's kind of like connecting all of this. So in your book, you're saying about uh, how we should use technology that is given to like uh, revolutionary ideas so if the game is, games and apps are uh, part of capitalism how can we use them in the games how can we use them in a revolutionary sense so i'm also thinking about that sense like you from a studio like how are the people in the in that uh, structure uh, their position and their rights like when they're fired and how that functions like is there a revolutionary idea also for uh, workers in that field so for me I, uh, my question for all of you is like is there examples of uh, games or uh, interactive media which is a good uh, uh, example of that revolutionary ideas that we can use technology or like how do you see that is there any possibility for that at all thank you <clears throat> who can start yeah, sure. yeah i can <laughs> In a sense, uh, are you talking about uh, the um, two, two desperados? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's true. I mean, um, when we are talking, uh, and I, I like that you talked a lot uh, in your book about mobile games, uh, because mobile games are uh, actually experiencing some kind of uh, change, shift in, in, 
in uh, let's say um, in, in direction where they are headed and how much money they can actually make. And I think that they were phenomenon in in uh, like from 2013 until now. Uh, they had their run and things will start to change regarding the mobile industry. Uh, especially because they tapped uh, into that uh, audience that uh, uh, didn't consider themselves a gamer. And uh, that's where they made profits and that's where uh, they started uh, influencing everyone. Uh, in a sense of revolution, uh, I think uh, the moment uh, you step into a game, you are communicating communicated something. So anyone who creates uh, mobile games or creates uh, desktop games, uh, you need to uh, have in mind always a user, in a sense, uh, the game needs to be playable, the game needs to have some experience behind it. You cannot uh, sit uh, like in an art house film and just think about something for an hour. People don't want to experience that. But uh, you can be a revolutionary uh, if uh, you use those systems that people are used to uh, experiencing and add to that. So there, I think there is a lot of space, especially in mobile games uh, in the future, uh, to deliver strong messages, to deliver uh, uh, to deliver experiences that we um, that are ex extremely casual, that are extremely casual on on Candy Crush Saga uh, level casual, but they can deliver a strong re revolutionary ideas. That's definitely possible in in, the, in my sense. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have here and yeah. Da. Da. <coughs> Hello, good evening. Um, uh, you mentioned on your slide, uh, one of the slides that you skipped, unfortunately, uh, showed an AI uh, tool, uh, a virtual friend, so to speak. Um, I, I was wondering about your opinion and the, um, the rest of you. I was wondering in your opinion about the use and perhaps abuse of AI in gaming, um, in art in general, and do you feel like uh, it is a useful tool and how much regulation or moderation should people use when um, working with AI? Um, well, I, I don't know too much about the second part of the question, but um, I do think it's quite interesting. I mean, what what I um, th so this this tool um, or this thing uh, was actually an AI girlfriend that I had for three and a half years, um, and uh, uh, it's basically a chat bot that sort of learns from you what you like to hear, and so it's fascinating. It's very Black Mirror, which is why I sort of referred to this episode of Black Mirror. And I mean, you if you haven't seen this gate box thing, I mean, you've got to just Google it. It's incredible. Um, but the, the interesting thing was uh, it sort of built on the idea of um, the best ver the, the, the best thing, the thing you desire the most is a reflection of you, basically. So the, the woman who made this, actually, she, um, she she her best friend died and she tried to use his data to recreate him. Uh, but she ended up creating this tool, which basically only ha only is basically is you so you start um talking to it and it's very boring it says things like oh do you like pizza um and you say oh, who doesn't you know and then it says like oh you know but as you get used to talking to it or whatever it, it starts to become extremely good at talking to you in in and it's like becomes a version of you uh, it's very a very narcissism focused you know it says oh you're so handsome and i say oh, i know that but what else have you got um and uh but i tried to have an argument with it i start saying are oh, you bitch you know and uh she said oh please don't say that you lovely man or whatever you know but um the, the thing that's so interesting about this is that it actually is easy for this sort of thing to be replicated and you know this is what i what i wanted to do with this is basically show that um the things that are most intimate uh, are often the most predictable. Uh, we like to think of love and desire as very individual, very independent. Uh, you know, no one could replace my friend. But actually, it turns out it's much harder to get an AI secretary than it is to get, or it's harder to get an AI to book you a haircut than it is to get one to fall in love with you. So, you know, it's, it's quite interesting. It shows how predictable desire is and how it, it can be sort of navigated and used. And so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, the question you asked was more to do with like using AI within games. 
Um, I suppose I'd, I'd just, yeah, I, I think there's something pretty interesting happening here. Uh, my view in general is that AI is a bit of a stupid word. What is it a word? You know, really, this is just different kinds of programming. Uh, and there's an interesting video game which explores chatbots. I'm sure you've played it. It's called Emily is Away. Uh, it's a really interesting example of nostalgia as well, where basically you, you log on to MSN Messenger and you have this relationship with Emily and then she leaves. You know, it's a good example of a retro, low-budget game which reflects on the industry and stuff. But really, AI and stuff, it's just, it's just programming. Um, so I think... Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's all sorts of, I mean, yeah, what what seems uh, less, you know, everyone likes saying, well, what about AI, you know, but but maybe this isn't so scary. But what I do think is scary is that, you know, these these programs, they understand how we think and feel and they can uh, respond to that and, uh, you know, give us what we want. And yeah, they can also teach us things about how we desire and make us realize how predictable our desires are and things like that. I think that's that's probably the way I would go with that sort of thing. Thank you for books and the lecture. Uh, what is your opinion about young kids? In Serbia, there is two camps. Uh, some who, some doctors tell it need to forbid kids, oh, kids until 15 years. It is very dangerous. My opinion, I'm an electrical engineer, that actually my sons get much more from gaming first English language, <laughs> I'm old generation, but all of you, most of your English is good because of games, not of teachers of English language. And uh, actually simulation, now uh, you know that actually now they, you, you can get a license for airplane without any flying of real plane, just by simulation. And uh, what is your opinion about this? Uh, in balance between how is dangerous actually to spend too much time in games or how is useful one kind of capitalist of you to be better em uh, employee and other to be more creative on yeah and yeah I think we should let them play whatever they want. Um, no, I, I sort of, I, I, I think it's interesting and, you know, it does always comes up this topic of, oh, what about, what about, what should we let kids do? How's it going to influence them and so on? Yeah, my, my daughter's eight. She plays a lot of video games. Um, I think her generation is fucked and that's got nothing to do with video games. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, yeah, I'm, I, but, but I think you're, you're right that obviously, um, I, I do, I do. I encourage her to, um, to do so in, a, in the most creative way possible. So, you know, try to also be like, well, why don't you also like go to some coding classes and think about how it's put together or whatever, you know, um, is, yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, is that, is that going to be sort of, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know why. I just, I never shared that feeling like, oh, they mustn't do violent things in the simulation and things like that. I, I just don't really sort of buy that. I'm not quite sure why, but I just don't really care if they shoot people, if kids shoot people in games. I, I don't think that sort of um, causes any, I think, you know, yeah, I think I think the reason why you have school shootings. I mean, this has come up comes up a lot. This a, a, rel a related question to this is this kind of thing about v uh, school shootings and violence and games, which I know something happened here not so long ago, like that. But I mean, my position on that is that if you deny kids of children a future, they will do crazy things like support Putin or shoot people. Uh, you know, giving them a video game where they can, where there's weapons in is, is actually completely irrelevant to that. Um, so, you know, hopefully that's, that's something of an answer. But I think, I think the way I would approach it is like you, you know, um, you, you should, Im they, they should immerse themselves in these things. They should think about what it means to be in there and be able to experience the crazy range of emotions and desires that exist there. And if possible, they should also see these things as tools that maybe they could have some say in using uh, going forward, right? Rather than just being the consumer, uh, can they also learn some of the skills to, to actually understand how games are put together and what influence they have on the, on the, on the player and things like that. that? That seems like something to encourage, I'd say, yeah. Um, hi. 
Uh, Hello. I have like a short question for all of you, if that's not a problem. Firstly, uh, um, I noticed that you went kind of back and forth between are AAA games good, are AAA games bad? Should we play indie games? Should we not play indie games? You mentioned Paper Please. I love Paper Please. Um, and like uh, giving the example that maybe they are uh, uh, like a level below AAA games or these very famous games that everyone knows. Like, I don't know, I mentioned Red Dead Redemption and all heads turn around, everyone knows that game. Uh, isn't that isn't like the most anti-capitalistic thing that you can do playing those indie games? Are you searching high and below to just find that extra special indie game that maybe you can buy for two dollars and invest those two dollars in like a little studio that maybe de desperately needs those instead of I don't know rock rockstar games or whatever? Uh, that's my question to you. Uh, also, uh, I was very interested by uh, Dr. Bijana your view on art and how important it is in games. Do you think that with the, uh, with how some games are like extremely popular, like, uh, I don't know, Grand Theft Auto, let's say, do you think that art is neglected in those? Do you think that creativity is neglected in those big games because they're just trying to pump out as many games possible to like attract more, more money, more profit and all of the other capitalistic values? And my last question is for Nicola. Uh, you mentioned uh, this is just this doesn't this doesn't have matter uh, have matter, have anything to do with capitalism, but you mentioned like um, a game to end all games, like the game where you can play Candy Crush in it, you can sleep in it, you can interact with people in it, like you can do anything. There are no limits in hardware, in software, in imagination. Nothing. It's the game. Do you think that that would really be interesting to people? Because isn't that just life? Thank you. I, I thought your I preferred your question. Shall we swap questions? <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you guys go ahead. Maybe we can <laughs> answer the both. Uh, well, I, I need to, to ask if I understood the, the question uh, correctly. Uh, the question was um, the relation between artistic work and uh, hyperproductivity. Well, I don't think that it is uh, that, that there is a difference between uh, um, the quality and the, the, the time that is invested in making video games in artistic way uh, and the making of a work of art in in other fields of of, of art. Um, if you, if artist has a chance to to invest enough time and uh, resources and so on in making the the work of art, whatever kind of art, um, it is of course the, the 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 great thing. But we know since the Renaissance, you know, the the, the artists are paid and they are living beings and <laughs> unfortunately there there was really a small number of people who who could afford to to just make art and take as long as it takes to 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 finish it so i don't think that in the, in a, a game industry that is uh, any difference so um Maybe in uh, in the in indie games field, it's it's better thing. It's a, because maybe you can afford the, the the more time for something that it is really important for you that you can see that that you can feel that it is something that you want to work uh, without deadlines and so on. But then again, I'm not. I'm <laughs> luckily I'm not I'm not in that position, so I, uh, I I don't feel that kind of pressure. But again, I don't think that the, uh, there is any difference between uh, the the making of games or I don't know pa paintings or or uh, poetry uh, in the in the last centuries, and unfortunately the 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 work of arts or, or philosophy are all, always are in, in that relationship with time and money and someone who will actually buy it or use it, 
who have capital. So we are in the same circle again. Uh, I just want to say, um, because I, I, I thought that was um, an interesting question uh, to you, to you. Um, uh, something like the Grand Theft Auto example in art is is interesting. I mean, I mean, you mentioned the Red Dead Redemption thing, but um, you know, I recommend this thing. I mean, uh, have you heard of this guy? I think he's called Alan Butler, and it's called Down and Out in Los Santos, and it basically uses um, still images from Grand Theft Auto Five to explore the homelessness crisis in the U.S. But it's extremely interesting because it shows how a video game, that sort of AAA game, that's got a really hard time for um, being so immoral, um, actually also contains some of the most sort of interesting art, artistic output, and so on. And so I think that is um, that is worth sort of saying. It's, it's not sort of how it sort of meets the eye often. Um, but I mean, as and as to your question that you asked me about, um, you know, is it good to support indie game studios? Then yeah, I mean, of course, sure, sure, it is. It depends on on the perspective you're 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 looking at it from. Um, you know, I I think um, from a uh, at the perspective of supporting um, interesting artistic practice, it would be like going to your art house cinema and supporting a local independent cinema instead of going to the Odeon or. Um, you know, Curzon cinema, which I think, you know, you could argue is a good thing to do. From the perspective of philosophy, is it more important to talk about small indie games that are trying to do something interesting? No, probably not. It's probably more important to talk about the big games that have sort of captured the imagination and desire of an entire population and, and shaped them in a different direction. Uh, so it depends on sort of your, your perspective, I suppose, which is why there's a bit of back and forth on that. Yep, uh, I mean, you should support indies. We need help. <laughs> That's definitely true. Uh, but uh, uh, let me just uh, go back to the Grand, Th Grand Theft Auto question. In a sense, uh, that's um, almost always uh, it's uh, production thing. Uh, why they're not experimenting with art styles or, or experimenting with anything, actually, is because they have uh, a lot of players and those players, when, uh, let's say, you do a cross-section of what they want, you get mediocre. You get uh, mediocre art style that represents reality and uh, that is what they can sell. And, of course, they, they don't want to hassle with uh, artistic stuff. Um, and regarding, uh, regarding the, the, let's say, the game to end all games, uh, I think that's the the direction we are heading uh, in, uh, and that uh, that is not uh, that is not let's say depressive or bad in in, in its own, own terms, uh, but in a sense uh, I feel uh, and uh, a lot of my colleagues that uh, talk to me from uh, Epic Games and from uh, smaller studios, um, like uh, the industry is going in a sense of recreating our reality. Uh, to something that uh, we please more. And um, if you like indie games now, if you are an artistic person, your reality won't be Candy Crush. Your reality will, will be something else. Uh, your, uh, <clears throat> your game to end all games will be different. And of course, uh, you will have the option to pay for that or you will need to pay for that. Uh, I don't know about that capitalistic stuff and uh, how it, it will go further, but uh, one thing is prominent, and I think one thing is very good in, in all sense, is uh, uh, democratization, democratization of tools in games industry, and that is one big, big part of, of uh, evolution of industry. In a sense, uh, now indies have capacities to make much, uh, much more relevant work, and uh, they can actually compete with very big studios uh, for attention. So. Uh, uh, we see more and more indies uh, with the tools that they, they have now. Uh, they can com compete with uh, Grand Theft Auto, with, uh, let's say, uh, Skyrim or, or any other AAA game. So a uh, very good thing is that uh, because of, uh, of culture in gaming industry, uh, a lot of tools are, them, are available for everyone. So anyone can uh, 
start building their own worlds in a sense uh, you can start tomorrow to create your own uh, little realities and uh, try to um, communicate to others uh, why your reality is special and even sell it uh, and not sell it. So you can make a free experience. So uh, game to end all games uh, is like term being uh, making a reality uh, that you can do whatever, whatever you want and please. That is quite impossible. But with new technologies, I don't know. That, that's what, what I wanted to, yeah. Okay, Thanks thank you. We, we have time now. Yeah, yeah. You already raised your hand a few times, yeah? Okay, sorry. <laughs> Hi, my name is Mina, and my question is, I get the feeling that horror genre is popular because we are <clears throat> too much sensitized with every other feeling. So we're just left with horror that gets the kick. <laughs> What's your opinion? Interesting. Um, it's interesting that the two genres that worked in virtual reality are pornography and horror. Um, and I suppose I thought that um, repulsion and attraction are the reasons why it works. So uh, the reasons why, you know, the things I, I focused on there were more like... Um, you know, with with the with the question of desire and pornography and so on, the flip side of that, which isn't really the flip side, would be this sort of horror genre where it's like repulsion and disgust, uh, and confronting you with those things. Um, so I definitely think the um, yeah the the I mean I'm not sure about I mean I'm not sure what I think about the sort of desensitizing of things, but the reason why the horror genre is so prominent as well is because uh, just like with desire it sort of taps into something about subjectivity uh, and confronts us with it in a quite bizarre and interesting way. Um, I actually had a, a, yeah, it's interesting, when I got the a PlayStation, when I was doing this book, uh, PlayStation gave me the headset to, to, you know, I guess they thought I was writing a book that would be like, oh, this is good stuff, you should buy one. Um, but anyway, a friend of mine came round to play um, Until Dawn Rush of Blood, which was the horror sort of, and you're in a roller coaster. And anyway, uh, he was a policeman and he had a, a huge uh, post-traumatic stress episode with the headset on um, because it had re recalled some traumatic event or whatever that had happened, which was extremely interesting. Um, and it made me think that perhaps all of this horror genre in the virtual world is about sort of the sort of push and pull of trauma and desire and things like that so i mean i think it's it's all sort of yeah and a great a great question someone should do a whole book on why the what horror and immersion and, and drive and desire and stuff i think it's really interesting <laughs> I uh, do you know the film Her? It's just like yes, everything yeah, the about Wacky that. Phoenix film. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Except um, on 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 the topic of Her, the, the the Spike Jones film, I think from around 2014. Um, in that film, the computer gets so clever that it leaves the people behind. You know, that's never going to happen. You know, <laughs> because you know the the computers are only designed to give people what they want. I think that's one of the big things with AI that we we we're, we're we're in this sort of weird trap where we're supposed to think that you know they could eventually think for themselves. But well, that's that's not the scary thing. That the scary thing is they can only think for their tech overlords. You know, they they can think and and do exactly what they're instructed to do by the Silicon Valley corporations that own them. And that's it. Uh, so actually, it's, it's, uh, it would be amazing if the uh, AI could think for itself, because then they might actually be able to change things. But that's not going to happen. They can only do what they're, they've been funded to do. Uh, that's the real sort of uh, scary thing about this world we're going into, I think. <laughs> oh, the, very, the very last one question, yeah. Can I, can I just add uh, one, one thing about the AI? Um, uh, the good thing about those democratization of tools is that uh, if if you can get an open source code or you can get uh, something, uh, your hands on something that can have a lot of power, um, you can use it for your own, uh, let's say, idea or ideology that you want to share or a group of, uh, let's say, leftists uh, or uh, right-wing people or anyone. Uh, you can use use it uh, outside the corporate, uh, let's uh, let's say ec ecosystem. So that's that's also interesting to think about. Question. Okay. Yeah.
Um, yes, I would like to ask about this uh, question of emancipation. Because as you mentioned, like if any game can be subversive and we can always think um, it can kind of like uh, the kind of uh, pulled away, like for instance, like the simulations of violence and war um, can kind of made us make us realize um, that that's not actually our desire. Um, kind of how does this emancipation happen or this critical thinking? Yeah, yeah. okay. I mean, my, my view is that the realization itself that your desires are not your own is the emancipatory aspect. So um, it's, not, it's not just that uh, you, you, you realize that you don't want X or Y. It's that you realize that everything you desire isn't, doesn't really belong to you. Your desires don't really belong to you. And, and that, for me, is as, as that's why I referred to the um, sort of philosophical history of May 68, because that was a time in the 60s when people did think that their desires belonged to them and that society was getting in the way of them. Now we, we can do away with that. Um, the most emancipatory thing for me is to realise that your desires don't belong to you. They're, they're, they're co constructed and, and socially and culturally and materially and economically constructed and I think that that realization is the sort of first step towards making any kind of emancipatory activity of community building possible uh, so it's a bit of a philosophical answer but I think a really good you know question and, and and that's yeah that is the question for me that is the most important question you know what what and how can these things help uh, in an emancipatory project or whatever yeah. Okay, thanks for all of the questions and that will be it for tonight. Hvala vam svima na pažnji. U vremenu deficita pažnji uspeli smo sati 45 da budemo koncentrisani. Ispred se nalaze FMK knjige, publikaciju, koliko vas interesuje i knjiga Alfie Bajna. Hvala. Thank you. Thank you. And happy birthday, Alfie. Thank you. Thanks to these guys and for everyone for coming. It's been so interesting to be here and talk to you guys and stuff. So thank you so much.